হ্যালো 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 হ্যাঁ শুনতে পাচ্ছ হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ শুনতে পাচ্ছি নীলাদ্রি নীলাদ্রি হ্যাঁ দেবেন না হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ শোনা যাচ্ছে শুনতে পাচ্ছ শোনা যাচ্ছে শোনা যাচ্ছে শোনা যাচ্ছে রাখছি আমি তো ও হ্যাঁ হ্যালো হ্যালো ইস দিস দা মাস্টার ক্লাস দিস নাই Yes, 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 ma'am. I'm a student. Oh. Anyway, good afternoon. Good afternoon.
नीलाद्रि तुम आयु द होस्ट को होस्ट हेलो नीलाद्रि कैन यू हियर मी नीलाद्रि यस यस बंद बोलो तो सर शैल वी स्टार्ट एट 3 पीएम तो वी वेट फॉर द प्रोफेसर समादर हैज जॉइंड यस कम ऑन तो शैल वी स्टार्ट द सेशन यस यस प्लीज स्टार्ट और यू कैन हेलो 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 यस कैन आई जस्ट चेक इफ शेयर स्क्रीन इज वर्किंग ओके और नॉट यस सर यू हैव योर टाइम it yes absolutely yes. fine thank you yes i can see no no to on karo hello Niladri Yes Ruan uh, uh, Okay uh, So let us proceed Yes yes please Yes okay Okay uh principal ma'am has joined Yes sir Okay okay ma'am okay. So I'm uh, okay with your permission everyone's permission very good afternoon to everyone it is great it is a great occasion for us on for us on behalf of greater kolkata college of engineering and management gis under the aegis of gis group to host today's idea of inter master class on the topic mind mapping tools of the mind for the idea management in the webinar this afternoon the eminent speaker of today's class is professor dr sukendu samazdar and myself dr devayan mondol hod basic science and humanities department of <clears throat> department of chemistry greater kolkata college of engineering and management will be coordinating this session i express my sincere thanks to gis group for giving us this opportunity to host today's event which is being shown live in social media i welcome all the honorable dignitaries the honorable faculty mem and staff members of my college and other colleges and my loving students to be a part of this wonderful occasion so with your permission let us start the inaugural session with a la digital lamp lighting ceremony Thank you ladies and gentlemen
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. May I now request our honorable principal, ma'am, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You're okay. audible. A very good evening uh, to all the dignitaries in our virtual, pla virtual platform, all my colleagues and all my beloved students. We all are uh, from the engineering education and hope that uh, we are acquainted with the term Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy, uh, it actually explains the educational learning objective with six stages. Those stages slot to cognitive domain, indicating how brain um, processes information and thoughts. The goal of educators using this Bloom's taxonomy is to cultivate higher order thinking skill in students' mind. These six stages are uh, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. The highest order of thinking is creation. And uh, creation, that is very much related to innovation. Innovation and in creativity go hand in hand. And you cannot push forward and create a space for innovation among uh, our students without enhancing the collective creative skill. Wherever creativity goes, uh, and by extension, rather, uh, wherever uh, talent goes, innovation and economic growth are sure to follow. However, Jazz Group, one of the largest educational conglomerate in India, always takes some leaps ahead in innovation. They have a unique concept of crowdfunding known as GIS Ideometer, an online funding platform where creators can share and gather interest on a particular project they would like to launch. The main objective of GIS Ideometer platform is to find the next generation entrepreneur uh, within the large GIS community. This is actually a first of its kind crowdfunding initiative introduced by any educational institute in Eastern India for its larger community members. Anyone belong uh, to GIS family, that is our students, faculty, and also um, our alumni member who are with us for the last 20 years, they can avail this facility. After team teaming up with at least one GIS community member, any individual will also be entitled to submit projects at GIS Idea Meter. To cultivate innovation, we know brainstorming is very much needed and mind mapping is the right way to have it. A mind map is a graphical way uh, to represent ideas and concepts. It is actually a visual thinking tool that helps structuring information, helping us to better analyze. Mind mapping uses the concept of radiant thinking, that is thought studied out uh, from a single idea, often expressed as an image. Branches flow backwards and towards, uh, forwards um, from and to the central idea. Hence, today's masterclass of idea or meter platform is on the topic, which is very much related, mind mapping, tool of the mind for idea management. In this regard, I cordially welcome Professor Shukhendu Shamajdar as the resource person to, know, uh, to uh, throw some light on mind mapping. I'm confident that this session will be an engaging one and help us to walk in the path of innovation. We hope to host Professor Shamajdar at our campus for more of such engaging sessions after the pandemic gets over. I take the privilege to thank Professor Shomaza for joining us and sharing his precious time. Thank you. Uh, over to Devan, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. That was really enlightened speech.
and uh, we are also very much happy to have Professor Sumar Dhar amongst us. And before the session is handed over to him, let me give you a brief introduction of Professor Sumar Dhar. Professor Dr. Somas Dar is currently with Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology, West Bengal, serving as Professor and Director of School of Natural and Applied and Social Sciences and the Head of the Department of Material Science and Technology, as well as Professor in Charge of the Center of Linguistics of the University. He has about 25 years of academic and 10 years of industry and corporate experience. Professor Shamazdar has 20 years of postgraduate research and work experience in the United States of America upon earning his PhD from the University of Michigan and Arbor he has opportunity he has he was appointed directly as an assistant professor at a premier university in Ohio USA in the capacity he engaged in collaborative research in material science with a group at MIT led by professor John van der Sade and then Dean of Engineering at MIT. Professor Samazdar is well published in journals like Applied Physics Letters, the Journals of Material Science, etc. He has supervised many postgraduate students for their thesis and the dissertation and made presentations at numerous conferences in all continents. After his tenure in academia, Dr. Samazdar had a stint in the corporate sector of the US notably at Toyota USA and Biomed USA. A BE from Jadapur University and an ME with a first class first standing and a gold medallion from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Dr. Shukhendu Shamazdar is originally trained as a materials engineer. However, at present, his interests are more versatile than specialized, including material informatics, creative pedagogy, incubation and startup, as well as the role of humanities in science and technology. He was a recipient of the prestigious Nehru Cambridge Scholarship and was recognized by the editor in chief of the Journal of Material Science for thoughtful contribution to that journal. Prior to joining to Macout, Professor Shukhendu Shamazdar served as the founding Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of Kajiranga University in Jorhat and Assam. Thank you, sir. We are very much <coughs> fortunate to have you us. And the next session is over to you. Here concludes the inaugural session. Let us proceed for the technical session. The session belongs to Professor Samadhar. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mondal. I doubt if I deserve that illustrious introduction. Anyway, uh, thank you and thank you, Principal Madam, for inviting me. These online platforms have done wonders. It has, they have brought many people together. They have basically meant the learning community boundaryless. So on behalf of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology and on my own humble behalf, it is a privilege to be part of an occasion like this. Today's topic is uh, mind mapping as has been pointed out. Uh, let me just. Uh, so this is the tools of, these are tools of the mind for idea management. That's what we are going to discuss today. However, it's important that uh, we take a pause and try to gauge beforehand what we are going to gain from a session like this. It's an awkward question. It is an awkward point, but it's important that we address it. Otherwise, it would be a meaningless exercise. What happens in 
sessions like this is the audience is usually heterogeneous and it becomes a bit of a challenge for the speaker or the session conductor to gauge not just because the audience is heterogeneous but the audience is invisible as well so i have to basically throw stones in in the darkness so why attend this session anyway let's start with this question two questions need to be addressed to find <coughs> meaning and significance of today's session and if we basically we need to ask ourselves have we ever had a good idea in our life and have we always been able to convert our good ideas into good outcomes now there could be different answers to this however if your answer is as in the screen that yes you have had good idea in your life however you have not been able to convert always those good ideas into good outcomes in that case i believe you will find some good nuggets in today's presentation i have tried to keep it in mind that the audience is heterogeneous very few, very few actually get into entrepreneurship they succeed that's that's the nature of the beast so some of you will try some of you will not even try some of you are academics some of you are teachers some of you are professionals some of you are students some of you are aspiring entrepreneurs so i'm going to give examples to cater to most of you so please attend the answer is yes to the first question and no to the next one if it is any other way most likely this session is going to be futile for you but for most of us i think the answer is yes for the first question and no for the second essentially managing ideas are like organizing our closets we have the things we have the ideas but we do not know where it is how it is going to be useful when is it going to be useful where it is hidden or at certain some time whether it is there or not so essentially it is the crux of the man is organizing and once it is organized the same ingredients can produce qualitatively different results the outcomes could be unimaginable the same applies to another situation let us say a heap of books if you have a if you are standing in front of a heap of books they are my they might as well be non existent because it is exceedingly difficult if at all possible to find the one that you need you wouldn't be attracted however it is when it is neatly arranged they become useful again here we see the idea of organizing i am insisting on it because that organization of ideas is essentially the key to make systematic persistence which eventually leads to outcomes that we desire and cherish like a disorganized and an organized closet but this unorganized mind and the organized minds are different and all of us at different times been through these different states 
when we felt organized, we, when we felt in control, we could act, we could adapt to changing situation, and we could relax when we were done. However, all of us have experienced times when we felt overwhelmed and paralyzed, frozen, really couldn't do anything. Any kind of advice, any suggestion, any friendly gesture seemed irritating. We reacted because at those times we felt cynical and we couldn't relax because we were tired all the time moving around. Our mind was just moving around. So idea, again, managing our idea is essentially an exercise in organizing the mind. Some slight differences actually makes a lot of difference. Here, if you see the top picture, that is okay, but it's not as good, as organized, as attractive, as appealing as the one that is below. Why is it so? How do we get there? We ought to have plans. There has to be different scenarios laid out very clearly so that we can check and see which one works best. If it is not laid out clearly, we really cannot visualize, nor can we act. The same could be appreciated here. It is the same heap of bricks, which when joined using a matrix, if using a mortar, that holds them together brick by brick after hard work it gives rise to an elegant and effective brick building the same ingredients so why the difference the difference is there is a reduction in entropy a change from disorder to order and that's what we are after when we manage our ideas what happens, we start seeing the path and it energizes us and we start moving along it and certain creative aspects starts materializing. So that's essentially the idea in terms of common day activities, common experiences, which we can relate to. And now I'm going to get into a little bit of theory, if you will, followed by examples. The underlying foundation, there are two things actually. One is the mind and the other is the idea. When we talk about managing tools of the mind or management of ideas, we are talking about ideas. So we need to know about the nature of the word idea, what actually an idea means. What is the nature of idea, the word idea? And the other thing is the nature of the mind. I would urge you to take a closer look because in these two visuals, the essence is captured visually. The nature of the mind, as you see, that it is not static. Any information that comes, it goes to different parts and it is interacting. So there is connectivity. Mind is essentially some sort of a network. The same actually is the case with the ideas as we will find soon. Now, how does the mind work? How does mind process information? It processes information in chunks, that is not in a piecemeal bit by bit or byte by byte the way computers do. Our mind actually remembers stories as a chunk. Our mind remembers memories as a chunk. So a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. And when you have a, what we call a big picture, uh, overview that is hello is anybody saying something to me hello uh, 
Am I audible? Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible. You are okay. audible. Sir, you are on mute. All right. Now, is it okay? Now take a look at this picture. Focus on this teardrop. This is changing the entire aspect. This is changing the entire message. Otherwise, an immaculate photograph. This teardrop is giving a sense of something is happening in the mind. So this is an example of a picture being worth a thousand words. And then when I was working for Toyota, there was very something very interesting I found out. And that was in Toyota, there was a standard protocol or standard operating procedure was to have all the report in a single page, in a one page. And that too was an A3 page. And after a while thinking, I asked several people and I didn't know what could really give a convincing answer. Eventually after several months, the mystery was solved. One is how the mind works because what you take in in one field of vision in one snapshot, that is what you process. So that solves the mystery of the one page. But why A3? A3 came because at that point of time, I, when Toyota introduced it, A3 was the largest size of paper which could be transmitted by fax so that the reports could be communicated with one another from one to the other. So mind works in this fashion. Number one is it doesn't remember piecemeal information. It processes information. It processes knowledge as chunks. And a picture, a graphics is a good chunk, which is attracted to the memory, which stays in the memory and which affects our mind. It makes us think and it makes us feel and that's how it makes us act. So that's how the, us, the mind works, which is somewhat relevant in today's session. Now is the word idea, how the word idea works. What about the word idea? Now, what part of speech is the word idea? That's perhaps a silly question. Some of you might be thinking, most of you are thinking. So I'm guessing you would say it's a noun. But what kind of a noun? There are some examples there. So is this a collective, countable noun, uncountable noun, collective sort of noun? So you're gradually getting into this mind mapping through this visuals like this. Actually, it could be argued that it's either a countable, uncountable noun or a collective noun. The praxis, the nature of the word idea, it is never an idea. No idea exists as a singular entity. It is always a network of ideas. Therefore, it requires organization. It requires connectivity. When we think of one light bulb glowing, we are actually misleading ourselves. It's not a good picture to keep it in your mind. So ideas, some part of the idea could be your own, some, yes, your own, but 
in another context, another time, you've got it. Some from your collaborators, some other thinkers, books, and different sources and resources. Some lead to dead ends and some to success. So whenever you or we think about ideas, let this network come to our mind, not the image of a light bulb. These are conventional images which, again, misleads us. Most of, unfortunately, I'm going to say something which is not very palatable, which is not very fashionable, but the fact is it is correct. Most of the conventional wisdom that's out there is not only inapplicable, not only wrong, but it's harmful. If we think that from the question mark to the idea, to the solution is a single step process, or it is a very well-defined stair-like step-by-step clean linear process, then we are making a big mistake. Life is messy. Anything that has to do with ideas, something as intangible, as complex as ideas is messy. We have to ask, we have to think, we have to do. We first have to try to clarify the question. What the central question, the driving question, the motivating question, whatever term you feel is, kicks, gives you the kick. You could use that. Then we try to get an idea. Then we act and see if the idea is actually yielding any outcome. It's some sort of an evolutionary process where the natural selection goes on. We try, the mind tries, and the nature or the environment selects. And there are mutations, the variations are there. We try different things. And it is crucial that we try different things again. So we ought to have plan A's, some plan B's. However, real life is always different from either plan A and plan B. It's much more messier. If we are thinking that we read something here, then we have an idea. We do a little bit of network, a little bit of trying, and we get success. Nothing could be farther from true. It is as messy as this, and we have to be prepared. Systematic persistence is the name of the game. And for that, untangling is crucial. And that's what we are going to do step by step today. So the essential elements of idea management are these six. First, assemble. That means idea is not a singular entity. There are components. So we got to assemble it. We got to be conscious about it, of the need for assembling ideas. Otherwise, we are not going to get anywhere. It, we, we might get somewhere. It's like getting some money winning lottery. Once it would happen, once in a blue moon, and then we would wait, basically spend away that money and we would think we deserved it and we'd never be able to learn. So people, this happens many, many uh, times in real life. People who succeed get success in, uh, somewhat easily. They usually, it is very difficult to sustain. They're, as they say, that it's even more difficult to stay on top than to get to the top. So assembly, after assembly, when you do assembly, you got to do it in order. So again, the image of the wardrobe helps. If it is not done in order, the assembly is basically meaningless. It is not useful. And when you assemble the components, they are connected or related to one another. We ought to be trying at least to understand how those relations are. And there are hierarchies. Hierarchies means basically the finished products or at one level, the output acts as the building block in the next scale, at the next level. I would, exa I would show you an example shortly. And then it is adapting. Unless ideas could adapt to the changing environment, it cannot survive. 
again, I use the metaphor of evolution because that's what it is. That's what it is. And once it adapts, then it evolves and emerges. Emergence means what? A new thing surfaces. For example, you could know everything and anything about hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. And about the molecule H2O, the little Mickey Mouse looking molecule. However, and that's a big however, when zillions of molecules of H2O get together, something strange happens. A property called liquidity emerges. It is impossible to predict knowing all the quantum mechanical stuff that we can know about subatomic and atomic level. So this evolution, this idea how it is going to click, when it is going to click, where it is going to click, it is exceedingly, it is not predictable. We always, most of the time, the explanations you get are post factor, not predictions. So it cannot be predicted. So plans are going to change. So plans in and of itself are, are not important, but planning is important. We have to keep on trying in a systematic fashion. And that's what planning. So here, what do you see? We see a soup, some sort of a disordered letters. This. Now, when we arrange it, we assemble it in order. There is assembly, but disordered assembly. It's meaningless. That means it is not useful. And in terms of startup and all that, that we are talking uh, in the context of today, that means nobody's going to pay you for this. So there is no willingness to pay, that is, if you define value. So what you do, you rearrange, you put the same letters in order, you assemble them in order, and you create a picture, you create some meaning, you create a bit of humor, and this, those of us who tried at some point of time to learn how to type, this is one of the first sentences that you type on the keyboard of old typewriters, as well as new keypads, QWERTY. This uses all the letters of the alphabet. So ordering is crucial. And when you go from order, now I would go give you this hierarchy. So order of one sentence, is connected to the others. So let us see in a hierarchy what it does when we construct several sentences, several words into a paragraph. Having eyes but not seeing beauty, having ears but not hearing music, having minds but not perceiving truth, having hearts that are never moved and therefore never set on fire. These are the things to fear, said the headmaster. As for Toto Chan, as she leaped and ran about in her bare feet like Isadora Duncan, she was tremendously happy and could hardly believe that this was part of going to school. So this is a meaning, this is a feeling that is getting conveyed, that is touching us because the same Letters, using the same letters that was there before in the top left corner, something like this have been constructed. So the elements are there. Now we need to really dig deep in, again, a systematic way. These are not flashes of inspiration. Things don't happen that way. Yes, we get inspired, but most of the time we really have to slow off. Writing. A touching sentence or a paragraph like this takes tens, if not twenties, thirties of revision and correcting oneself. So mind mapping, what is it anyway? A mind map, as Principal Man has pointed out, is a visual tool for structuring. 
So I have kind of uh, printed in blue the keywords and key phrases. So it's a visual tool. Why visual? Well, why visual means the, rather than uh, why visual. The point is, what is important about visual? Why do we choose a tool that is visual? Because those of you who know about brains would know that it's a visual cortex, which is the most powerful part of the brain. So our, we are essentially visual animals. Our sense of smell is not that strong. So we have evolved our DNA, basically the script of the life for Homo sapiens is such that we can process, we are designed to process visual information better than any other kind of information. Textual information is only maybe 10,000 years old. Visual information is there as long as animals have been there. So visually, instead of textually representing ideas, is much more innate, much more animalistic, and that's why much more organic, and it gets in us. It can be used on an individual level as well as a team-based level. And it's a hierarchical diagram. It, it has different levels. It has different layers. The diagram is focused on a single element that is the driving question or the motivating question. And ideas are written down spreading outward as again, Principal Madam has pointed out, radiant is, if I recall correctly, is the word she chose. Important thing of spreading and recording key ideas is ideas are like human beings or animals. They breed. If they're nurtured properly, if they're not, then they become impotent, infertile. But if they're nurtured, if they're handled, if they're raised properly, together as a family, they breed and trigger further ideas. And then they form their own families, which is equivalent to not natural grouping. So we all know this, but my Purpose today is to bring this to our consciousness from the tacit and implicit subconscious to some sort of an explicit domain so that we can make use of, translate into action what we already know. So this is an example of a very simple mind map or concept map. These two words there are some persnicated people who would argue that they are different here for the practical purpose. And today's session, I'm going to use those two interchangeably. Now here, energy, as you see, that one can, there could be different viewpoints. You might be interested in storage. Somebody could be interested in generation and someone perhaps a bit theoretical or bookish might consider it from in the forms of energy. So there are different energy uh, ways of looking at it, different ways of storing it, different ways of generating it and different forms. So this gives an overview or big picture that we have talked about. But it doesn't have to be in some sort of a fancy way expressed in this fashion. This actually I find it better. You start at the core, some in the middle. You start with a blank paper, preferably a chart paper. A A4 size is not enough. Then you select the subjects. You use colored pens, main topics, subtopics. Structure is important. Hierarchy is Basically, it will start coming naturally as you start practicing. And this is if it's not just for people who want to become entrepreneurs. This helps. This is a very useful and effective technique of note taking. We always, most of us, are trained to take notes in a linear, textual fashion. But 
in different parts of the world, I have seen, they, these are taught actually, how you take effective notes. And these mind mapping techniques are in use. And I'm actually happy nowadays to see here that even in India, here with the CBC, uh, SC syllabuses, NCERT books, and their curriculum, they emphasize mind mapping. So you can use keywords, you can bold it, you can have your own code. So to say your, your means just not you, uh, you as a singular, but your teams and can basically precipitate your ideas into a shape, into a form, into something explicit, something communicable. This idea of idea management is actually not new. This is a typical Reed and Kellogg diagram. And in the mid, until the like, mid 20th century, grammar was taught this way, where sentences, their connections were explained using such tree diagrams. Let's take this example in the epic Mahabharata, Arjun killed his brother. Basically, what is the essence? The essence is Arjun killed his brother. And then there are branches, that means his brother. And where did you find this information in Mahabharata? And what is Mahabharata? It is the epic. So this, again, is not something very new. It has been there. And since it is not new, it has passed the test of time and it works. So, what we are asking, I am asking ourselves or you to do is to map your mind. But the question of course is why and how? The first is, the reason is, otherwise it would be disorganized like that closet. Our ideas would be disorganized. So structuring and organizing ideas. Number one, that is one of the reasons, that's the purpose. Then it shows the relationship between ideas, the connectivity. Unless we have, we know how they are connected, they are isolated and they, there is no synergy. We cannot visualize, we cannot sense the synergy embedded in them. Visualize the overall concept and eventually surface creative solution. So this is crucial. Once you see a structure map, a mind map, a concept map, a few things become explicit, which were implicit. The connections, the structure, and then that leads to possibilities. So those, the way front or the state of the art kind of becomes visible. So one can think now, okay, there is a gap. That gap is all of us, like a, a researcher, a, a entrepreneur, all of us are trying to identify the gap where the problem exists and would like to propose a solution to contribute to the society, to have a good high impact publication or to make money as a successful entrepreneur. And how do you do that? You start primarily asking, focusing on what I call a driving or a motivating question. Then do brainstorm because very, I mean, this is, uh, it goes without saying brainstorming helps because more, more people bouncing ideas and something uh, uh, like an alloy of copper and zinc, you get a brass which is stronger. Then you identify the main idea, you order your ideas, and eventually build the map. That's how it's done. So this is the concept map of concept maps. I've started with a circle because the interrelationships are crucial. Here, these are very, some of the important nodes, the 
organize part, the linking of words, the hierarchy and the focus in questions. What is important is these part, the associated feelings or effect. Without feelings, without emotion, we cannot be moved. Actions do not take place. And recall that teardrop on the uh, cover of the book by Pink. How the mind works that had this feeling it evoked feelings so it is important that the maps are done in such a way the maps once you do the maps they will actually evoke feelings yours as well as other pseudo here now some sort of uh, what again principal madam pointed out it is related to bloom's taxonomy from rote learning just having remembering piecemeal information to the higher level and this meaningful learning requires well organized structured knowledge and emotional commitment as well not just the cognitive And this is where in education, in pedagogy, in assessment, in curriculum development, the role of mind mapping and concept mapping comes as well. Now I will give a few examples from school or college level. This is the mind map or concept map of state of matters. Take a closer look, maybe all of you know all of it, but I doubt that. That I'm not doubting that you do not know all of it. What I'm doubting, including myself, that whether I could have just like that, or you could have just like that, been able to produce something like this. Whether all the pieces of knowledge and the connections were explicit in your mind. Usually that is not the case and that is what holds us back. And once these usual normal things are there, there are less common, less commonly known stuff here. So the moment these are areas that I have pointed out that new knowledge surfaces or we can see the border or the wave front of the knowledge using mind maps, this exemplifies. This is even simpler, perhaps, or equal. It is a trigonometry, how we can. All of us know this, pretty much all. But the connections are given, and it's a bit, the bigger picture, or it's an overview whole. So, instead of remembering each piece individually, this gives the context. And contextuality is, is crucial. Unless I am convinced why, especially in andragogy, that means learning of, or, or the teaching and learning of adults, having an idea why is very important. Students, I mean, Students don't care how much I know until they know how much I care. So in order to care, we need to give, have, have the context clear, shared context. This shared contextuality is an important aspect of living cooperatively and creatively. And mind maps and concept maps helps us along the way. In curriculum design, we could use it. So those of us who are in teaching and academic administration, this could be a useful tool. All of us know about this program, outcomes, course outcomes. We talk about this, but we do that mostly in disjointed fashion. So if we do draw a mind map, it helps. I, have, I am in the board in academic council of several uh, universities colleges and several high institutions of higher education. Unfortunately, I have never seen, I've, I have to vet 
many documents on curriculum, but I have never seen a diagrammatic representation of curriculum. In Europe and in the US, this is fairly, the, that's the standard practice. However, here it hasn't taken off yet, but perhaps it is going to. Then coming to business, it doesn't look like a diagram, yes, but it is a diagram. It is a mind map. There the central idea is business and its strategy and the different branches are marketing, what are its goals, the SWOT, strength, weakness, opportunity and threat analysis, documents and tools and team formation. So these are different arms of the business, if you will, that one has to be aware of, one has to exercise and make them strong. So one aspect, once you know, then we can delve deeper. It is a top down sort of thinking. So in business strategy, there is marketing is important. So we focus now in this map, the driving question, the motivating question of the central theme is marketing strategy and one is identifying different aspects of it. Risk, that's something, whether we like it or not, we have to live with. So we better understand it and try to manage it to some extent. So it helps to have a map. Map means clarity. Map means connection. Map means getting the bigger picture map means understanding the concept, knowing, you know, in the map, this point, the point X marks where you are. And that gives an idea that makes us somewhat better at or where that increases the probability of going where we would like to go. Another aspect of tremendous importance, especially for startups, is projects. What startups are are nothing but projects that need to be managed. And this is a diagram. This is a critical path method diagram, which is a mind map for project management. Projects are characterized by activities. Activities start they have a duration and they have a finish time. There are in a, even in a reasonably sized project, there are hundreds of activities. And we are puzzled and literally bewildered. We do not know unless we put it clearly in a diagrammatic fashion using an effective tool, what is important and what is not, what is critical and what is not. We might luck out as some of our gut feelings might come true but most of the cases they fail. So scenario planning without explicit mind mapping or concept mapping using tools such as this PERT or CPM methods there are software tools available to draw such things fairly easily we cannot identify what is critical. And why is it important? Because life is full of uncertainty. I ought to know where the slack is. Let us say there's a wall. And if that wall is bearing load, if I try to make a window in that wall, the entire room is going to collapse. But if it is only a separating wall and there are supports in terms of pillars, which is bearing the load, I can cut out the wind and take in the view. But if it is otherwise, it would be disastrous. So here, if there is a delay in one of the critical paths, one of the events which are part in the, which fall in the critical path, the consequences are going to be severe. So, these critical events, the criti critical activities need to be monitored very carefully. We have limited amount of time. So many things uh, an entrepreneur has to do. So these are the ones on 
his or her dashboard, which are going to be monitored very, very carefully. And a mind map, like the CPM diagram can help you. And you can play with it, uh, chalking out, looking at different scenarios, what the variability would have, what sort of impact. Design thinking. Essentially, anything that is managed has, is born twice, once in your mind and once in reality. And any experience or any product is basically is designed. Anything that is an artifact other than something in the nature. So here in design thinking, there are different aspects. And once those are laid out clearly, for example, prototyping, testing, ideation, then it helps to proceed in a systematic fashion. And it doesn't guarantee success, nothing does, but it increases the chance that you would come up with a better product. Your services will be more in demand and your chances of your the flourishing, the chances of flourishing of your business is going to be higher. Creative intelligence, they are also, you have originality, flexibility, note taking, a variety of things that radiating out of it. However, what I like is this one, even in writing, it helps. Writing subtitle, plots, themes, characters, the protagonist, antagonist, and secondary characters, and how you're going to, let us say, if you're going to, if you're planning to write a novel, a map like this helps. And pretty much all the professional authors, they use it. There are software tools like Rationale, which helps building maps like this. So the plot is, is clear in your mind. The scheme is clear in your mind. The relations are clear in the writer's mind. Then we always talk about nonverbal communication in addition to verbal communication. But what are they? How do, are, do we really pay attention to nonverbal communication unless we know what the elements are? So having a list like this helps. Facial expression, humor, eye contact, the loudness of the voice, gestures, postures, tones and sounds, touch, body language. If these are laid out like this, next time, perhaps it would be easier for me to pay more attention to nonverbal communication than if it were not laid out. Now, let me give a few examples. I'm, I'm, because I'm apprehensive I'm suspecting that some of you are thinking, do you, those are silly examples. Nobody in real life they actually uses it. Here are two examples. This one, Walt Disney, 1957, actually used the map, mind map. This is the map. You see merchandising license, how detailed it is, magazines, publications, creative talent and studio, theatrical films, TV commercials, how the entire Disney production is conceived. The mind is, again, in the absence of a better word, mind dumped in a systematic fashion. The mind of Walt Disney, wish upon a star and from the map of this map. Then NASA exploring Mars. This is again a real example from the paper by Briggs. By the way, there are uh, Duhan, then there is Buzan, I'm sorry, and then Novak, and there are several authors who have done very serious theoretical work on mind mapping and concept mapping, and Briggs as well. And there are some work by Stephen Pinker, of course. So this is what NASA uses. And each of these 
uh, actually can be analyzed further. For example, the next thing, here is the human mission and this one details or elaborates the human mission. So this is an example of hierarchy from one level to the other. So when here, when will this take place? So under what circumstances, when? So some of the conditions, technology is ready, risk is acceptable, cost is affordable, resource issues, science issues, and all that. Again, from a jumbled up situation to a reasonably clear situation. The difficulty hasn't changed, but it is no longer paralyzing. This helps us to move. Maybe we get stuck in a dead end. All right, we turn around and move, start moving in another direction. But the unorganized mind or the disorganized mind, as if you recall, is essentially paralyzed. It cannot move. Motion is not going to be easy. However, motion is going to be possible if we keep uh, organizing our mind using mind maps. Now, there are other tools and for the next maybe another 10 minutes, I would take to, I would give you examples of old proverbs made new. As I have pointed out, most of the advice or the notion or the wisdom that's available out there actually doesn't help. It harms. One of the biggest thing that it, it's talked about is think outside the box. But read my lips. I say, think inside the box. Why? Because we are not ready. Very, very few of us are prepared to think outside the box. Let's go back to a class six. What did you need in history or geography or mathematics or geometry? You needed a syllabus. I don't need a syllabus today. Many of you perhaps don't need a syllabus today. You learn on your own. That is fine. But when we are not ready, we need a structure. We need disciplines. We need shapes and forms in front of us so that we can follow. So unless there are forms, we cannot learn. In fact, forms cannot break forms. Artists know this much better than I do. So thinking inside the box gives us the perimeter. It's like visualize yourself in in the no man's land of Antarctica in the winter, you would lose your bearings because you are outside the box. So it sounds good, it's fascinating, but it's actually, in most of the cases, thinking outside the box is useless. What is useful is think inside the box, such as this. Always in life, we have more to do, so much to do and so little time. How are you going to prioritize? Eyes in our matrix. What is urgent is most likely, most often not important. And what is important is hardly urgent. So using a box like this, we can categorize. We can classify what we ought to do. So these are, visualize them as buckets. And you have different items. And you pick up one item and see if it is where, which is the right bucket for it. If it is a phone call, some interruptions, some pleasure reading for snacks, then it is not important, but you are feeling an urge, a craving. So it falls in the quadrant of distraction or illusion, perhaps. Is that something I'm going to pursue all my life? 
hopefully not. Then there are crisis quadrants, quadrants of demand. For example, there's a gas leak in my home. If it happens, if I smell from my kitchen a gas, I have to drop this and attend to that. So similarly, somehow suddenly you get here, oh, there's a deadline day after tomorrow of a big grant. There is a possibility. So you drop everything else that is indeed important. That could be a life changer, a game changer for you. At the same time, urgent. The same happens to a suddenly announced examination for a student. Or suddenly we saw my dream job advertised somewhere and the deadline for submission of the CV is by midnight today. So that's urgent and important. The worst of all is this, the quadrant of delusion or escape. Basically, mindlessly watching television, binge, binge watching, or doing Facebook, so uh, all sorts of other things. I, I have nothing against Facebook, but just uh, basically meaning I mean, activities which are addictive, which are harmful in the long run, and which creates, which are attractive in the short run. They are neither important nor urgent, but we are hooked and that's why it is called addictive. What makes you a more effective person, a more successful person is being in quadrant two, the zone. Now, how do you do that? That is focus on something important before they become urgent. And there you can relax. It is an organized mind which can try to do this and stay effective uh, stay engaged and be effective at work yes be relaxed and have a good night's sleep now we all of us have 24 hours so how do you do you shift the boxes so basically the place to start in managing time oh i should correct myself that's another wrong thing that we usually do. We cannot manage time. Time flows at even pace. We manage ourselves. So time management, I think, is a misconception. It's a misnomer. We should say self-management, our activity management. So using a thinking inside the box tool, such as this Eisenhower two by two matrix, we can identify our daily activities, we can classify them and see what is the larger quadrant. The quadrants are not balanced like this. Mine might be mostly quadrant four, yours might be mostly quadrant one or two. So the way to live an effective life, a better life, a fulfilling life is to shrink quadrant four and expand quadrant two. The other one is prioritizing your effort in terms of the rewards. So we have values, we can have, we have activities which are low effort or high effort, low value and high value. Yes, high effort, high, high value activities with high effort is okay, but it's not fun. High effort with low values, low, is really back breaking. This is Yes, you might be thinking you are doing a good job, but really nothing is happening. So we got to aim properly. And again, in order to aim, we need to classify. And there again, this thinking inside the box or the square or quadrant or matrix, whatever term do you like, it helps. These are the ones that we should choose and they'll pick the low hanging fruits first. Try to identify activities or projects which could yield decent value with minimal amount of effort. 
similar thing applies for minimum viable product matrix. Those of you who are aspiring to be or who are in startups or entrepreneurs, this is a very important thing to know. What is a minimum viable product? You include the features which are urgent and important and you eliminate the ones which are not important. Unless you know, unless you eliminate certain things, certain features from your product or services, your chances of success is going to reduce. It's going to come down. So what is not urgent? You might want to have a plan. So, okay, in the next version, you are going to include that. And what is not important, it could be outsourced to another person. So these are certain examples of thinking outside, oh, inside the box. Then we come to the power of the checklist. Checklist means having things laid out in the form of either as a list or as a table. And again, that helps because it does the same function as the map by making things explicit rather than embedded in our mind in an implicit fashion. Once they are implicit, they cannot interact. I mean, if they're, when they're implicit, but once they're explicit, they are being born and they can interact and they are capable of giving birth as well in course of time. So one way or one phrase that is commonly used is scamper, that you substitute, combine, adapt, modify, magnify, put to another use, eliminate or rearrange. So there is a situ scenario, there is a situation, there is a product and how do you do your brainstorming? So you ask questions like what would happen if I changed X for Y. So that is substitution. This generates ideas. These are tools of brainstorming with others as well as with yourself. Then combine. Again, these are not rocket science at all. All of this we know, but once we have them listed in front of us on a notebook, it helps. It helps us to perform under pressure. So combine is what would happen if we Combine X and Y, put the two together instead of having them separately. Adapt, again, is how could we adapt this thing to a different context? Say you have a product and you are thinking it's not working, but it is nothing is in isolation. So the contextuality or thinking in terms of the environment is crucial for evolutionary success. So even if it is not working in this circumstances, in this context, is there a context where this is going to be useful? And often such, asking such questions helps to identify those environments where the product you have already developed is going to be, or the services you have already developed are going to be useful. Then you could modify certain aspects of it to make it the value proposition stronger, put it to another use, or often it helps is to downsize of some sort, you make it slimmer, you eliminate certain aspects of it. It controls the cost as well as it makes it leaner and slicker and more appealing. And sometimes you do reverse, that is you go back re and rearrange as well. So this is the scamper method. This helps, this is particularly effective in brainstorming with others, but it helps us. You could be, you, one could practice it uh, by oneself as well. So there is, if you have a canvas like this, you can basically fill out your own ideas along this line uh, for your own project that you are trying to do some brainstorming on. Then there is this pitch canvas. This helps, this is articulation under pressure that, or what they say, the elevator pitch. You have to say something in front of investors or somebody who is going to approve your project, then if you structure your pitch according to some of these headings, like what pain does it alleviate? That means what problem does it solve or what kind of gain? That means what opportunity it presents 
to a potential user. Then product demo, custom attraction, investment. So again, this will help to structure and, and bring out the knowledge tacit that, that is tacit inside you is to bring it out and make it visible and more effective. This is the persistent framework, which is my favorite because I believe life and any meaningful pursuit actually involves per systematic persistence, be it academia, be it in sports, music, entrepreneurship. So we have to identify the problem, identify the earnings model, identify the risks, size of the market, innovation, scalability, team, entry barriers. It is very important to erect entry barriers. Otherwise, you will have copiers and imitators and you will lose essentially your competitive edge is going to be gone pretty soon then the niche that you are for, uh, filling and traction that is interactions with your customers and the clientele so following uh, this persistent framework helps at especially at the start of level so this is one example then again in, in this is the journalist's approach, the basic six. You could ask the very basic questions. For example, I was putting together, I had put together a proposal for a biotechnology park. And so, something very simple. This what, why, who, when, where, and how. Something very simple like this helps us help our mind guides our mind and helps us put our uh, organize our thoughts so these are examples of what i showed were examples of mind mapping and now a couple of examples or testimonials of people who have actually benefited from it this is one person rudra samajda he just completed, he had last year completed his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in chemistry. And he's joining NPL, National Physical Laboratory in London, in about, uh, in the, his joining date is 2nd of November. So he, during his research, has found the idea of the practical principles and of uh, mind mapping attractive and practiced it religiously and it helped so this table of contents for example are these drawings that nowadays that have to be given part of your abstract in many uh, reputed journals these are in a sense representations of mind or the concept map now this kind of these are neat but especially this paper this work on, on the battery uh, lithium cell some certain cells that he worked on his actual mind map looked like this that was a rough you can see, you can see the fold of the full skip paper a single usually a single uh, a4 size doesn't help you have to have a larger paper and this is the actual one that he used so this is an example from a research successful researcher in academia now i go to a successful startup person or someone who aspiring startup person who has secured a good grant this is dr dhanwal kumar swami and his company is called glorious phyto labs private limited and he is proposing a new way of producing Phytochemicals. I don't know nothing about the subject in the sense that I'm neither a pharmacist nor a chemist. However, what I could see here is a logical diagram where different issues have been marked with different colors and a pathway, a systematic and organized approach is visible. Things are written here as well.
Then here, there's a comparison matrix on different factors or features. How does his company uh, stack up against existing competitors? Again, this is not rocket science, but making, giving you an overview in a clear fashion so that one can make a judgment. One can assess the probability of success, whether it has value, this proposition has value or not. However, his, when he made the presentation, some of the reviewers had certain doubts, so asked for certain clarification. The proposed project can be sanctioned provided experts get convinced by the costing and technology standardization was the concern raised by the viewer. And it really, as Dr. Kumar Swami shared with me, in a textual, linear textual fashion, this concern could not, he could not address them. So what he did, he resort to something called the fishbone diagram or Ishikawa diagram. Here is his automated separation technology. That is the backbone of his proposed project. And it has materials, processes, hardware and machine vision. These are the major contributors to this. And these major contributors have sub-contributors to this as well. So once he is, when he is actually thinking, this is going to help him to think how to execute the project and how to control the quality. So the effectiveness this Y is a function of so many X's. So this is a quality tool that has been introduced and popularized by Ishikawa of Japan. And that's, uh, again, that's one representation of uh, mind map or concept map, and it helps. So here, this is his business model. key partners, key activities, value, again. I am not getting tired of repeating that it's not rocket science because it is not rocket science. However, it is making things clear. It is making things understandable within a reasonable amount of time. And it is making things communicable to others and actionable to the principal investigator. The timelines, again a picture is what a thousand words. And the reward after stumbling on the first attempt was getting a grant of 50 lakhs for 18 months. And he acknowledges the benefits he derived from using so what we have seen, the principles of it, the underlying theory, a few silly examples, a few classic examples such as Walt Disney and, and NASA. And we have seen that not, uh, the conventional wisdom is not always right. Often, instead of thinking outside the box, it helps you to organize your thoughts and ideas by thinking inside the box it provides the perimeter and later on we saw that did the power of the checklist and certain cases live cases these are cases that i have personally been involved with of deriving benefits real concrete benefits out of practicing uh putting or rather putting the principles of uh, mind mapping in practice if this is the concluding slide. It's about having a balanced life. And this is a visual that identifies some of the fundamental drives that we have, the drive of love, passion, needs, 
So if using a Venn diagram, it shows what is the profession, what are vocations, what is passion, mission, and where everything hopefully overlaps. This is the area of Ikigai, that is a meaningful life. If we are here, there might be excitement and complacency, but a sense of uncertainty. So this is the area, if one can get there, apparently, as they say, those who have been there, I am not there, I must confess, but those who have been there, who are at least for a certain period of time, they say it gives you a sense of success as well as peace and fulfillment. And I find this representation useful to, to work life or all sorts of balances and it provides a compass for one to make a reasonably balanced living. Thank you for your time. And uh, this, uh, I am involved in providing mentoring for aspiring incubates or those who are involved would like to do some startups and entrepreneurship. So I give you their my contact numbers are there. So if I could be of any use or any service to you, let me know. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Professor Shamazdar. That was really an interesting and really a, a knowledgeable uh, session to discuss with you. And uh, uh, we before that, Next session, uh, I'm uh, started. I said uh, that there'll be a question answer session that I had discussed yesterday with you over phone. And uh, so I have a question uh, in the chat box. I find Ahona Chatterjee, a student of uh, Sri Shikshatan College, has put a question. Uh, uh, and uh, may I uh, ask Ahona Chatterjee to ask the question to Professor Samazdar? Ahona, if you please uh, ask your question. Niladri, please uh, unmute Ahuna. If... Very good afternoon, sir. Sir, actually, you just gave a good session, very much interesting session. And you just provide us the notions regarding the mind map. How can we execute anything with the help of this mind map? Mind map. So while answering some uh, certain type of questions, which is very much debatable in kind of uh, in kind of a way, which uh, we don't know, it must need to be certain or it must need to be specific. So we need to answer it from the uh, from the start of the introduction and then end it from this uh, from the start of the confusion and go at its end. So why do we need mind map or over on this uh, over on this writing answers on that questions? Like why it is a uh, why mind map uh, mind maps are very much significant by writing debatable questions. So. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Now I could unmute. Actually, that's a very important question. It touches on something that I have been a bit cautious to avoid or move around. That is controversial, debatable questions. The reason it is particularly important to have mind map or mind dumping to realize what your thoughts are at the conscious as well as in the unconscious and subconscious level. So that everything is out on the table. 
And once it is out on the table, depending on the context and the audience, you can do pick and choose what to say now and what to save to, for sharing later. So if it is not mapped out, you really do not know what is inside you. And at an, uh, rather a moment, it might come out, which can be harm or which may not be really something that you would like to know or, or do because it might not be properly articulated. So that is, uh, it, it prevents you from being reactive and being out of control. So mind map, especially on the debatable and controversial issues, help you to maintain your poise and articulate in a controlled fashion. Ohuna, I guess you, I, you have got your answer. So I'm requesting anybody who's having any question to Professor Shamazdar, he's free to answer your question from the listeners and the participants. Anyone has any other, I mean, question, he, can, he or she can directly ask to Professor Shamazdar. Well, sir, Ohuna is having another question. Ohuna, please go ahead. Well, well, I have an, another question, like regarding the idea when we, we are gaining idea from something, from any kind of sources, we, we cannot have the capacity to utilize it, how to execute that thing. So it's depend on the man to man. It's very on the man to man qualities or capacities. Like, I am having the idea just like any other person is having the idea. I am having the same quantity of brain amount just like Einstein had. So, but I didn't have the, uh, the proper gesture or proper positions to pro to prosecute these ideas. So, how far the mind map will help us? Well, the name you uttered, I'm a little hesitant to comment after that on Einstein. However, it's, I would like you to think of, go back to the imagery of the disorganized closet and the organized closet. So often we do not know what we know unless we articulate it put it on paper or put it on any media. You make a movie or you do a painting, whatever it is. So what you are capable of, you are demonstrating it to yourself that I am capable of this. So your ideas are becoming visible and palpable to yourself. And that is one of the major, most important benefits of mind mapping, that it, it acts like a mirror. It helps you to take a peek inside your mind. So that way, you know, I have it. So it's like exercising to some extent, I can feel my muscles while I do the exercise. And the more the, I feel my muscle, the more confident that I get that, okay, I can lift this much of weight or I can do so much of work. So in a similar way, mind mapping helps you to see how much, what is in there and essentially plan out to exercise those, translate those, what is in there into action. And this, why would you do that? Or what is the benefit in one way? It helps you build your confidence. It helps you build your confidence. You know what you are capable of. You know what's in a, out there. Otherwise, always there is a self-doubt. Always you feel oh, oh, a big tentative. So once it's out there, it is, it's kind of precipitated on paper or on some medium, 
it gives you more confidence. Anybody has any question? Anybody wants to discuss with Professor Majun uh, Somazdar relating to mind mapping, mapping technique, personal mind map, industrial, corporate, in every sector he has touched. If you don't have any question, then I have a one last question. Uh, well, uh, I can uh, um, I can see that uh, I cannot uh, identify the name and give some numbers. Uh, please go ahead with your question. The one who is logging with 91998, if I'm not making a mistake. Please. Hello. Please question directly. Hello. Well, I think uh, he has, uh, he or she has disconnected. So uh, let us conclude the session. Uh, uh, I think that was really a wonderful session to be uh, with interaction with Professor Samazdar regarding the mind mapping, mapping technique and how the personal mind map takes place inside a person that helps to bring the, uh, uh, in, in, in the great genre of industry, corporate sector, teaching, education and every sphere taking in touch of the Bloom's taxonomy. That was our principal ma'am had said earlier. And uh, we are really fortunate enough and thankful to Professor Shamazda to share his time, valuable time. And I'm thankful to JIS Group, JIS University for giving us this opportunity to hold this idea of meter a platform, which is really a wonderful effort by the group to promote the educational in entrepreneurship excellence. And I, I hope Professor Samazdar will be available in our next ventures. And it was really a wonderful interaction with him in the Zoom platform. And physically, we would like to meet more and I'm thankful to every participants here, all my fellow colleagues of my college and different other colleges, my beloved students, to be a part of this program. With this happy note and taking your permission, I'm signing off <clears throat> and hope you have enjoyed the session. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everybody for conducting and thanks for your patience. Thank you. <laughs>